tonight, Invisible Water, Invisible Watersheds, the Gowanus Canal is a case study. We're looking at water in the Gowanus Canal. Um, this program is connected to our new exhibition at Brooklyn Historical Society, Dumbo, titled Waterfront. And in a moment, my colleague Julie Golia, BHS's Director of Public History and the Curator of Waterfront, will come up to introduce the evening's panel, or the evening's moderator, I should say. But first, we have a very special guest, someone who has been a great friend to Brooklyn Historical Society, a friend to New York City, a friend to the neighborhood that we're talking about tonight. Um, he is someone who does not just talk the talk, but truly walks the walk. I am so pleased to welcome City City Council Member Brad Lander to the podium to greet you with a few words. Thank you so much, Marcia, and to the Brooklyn Historical Society, this great crowd. I've got a dynamite panel, so I will be very brief. Um, I think we are so lucky to have an institution like BHS, which is helping us think about our past in ways that deeply inform the present and the future, and there's no place where, in my opinion, that's more interesting to do than around Gowanus. Um, we have this opportunity right now to be shaping its future, and those debates are coming up all the time. They came up last week in the city council. They're going to come up later this year in the city council. They're coming up at the federal level as we're debating Superfund and EPA. Like The politics of the Gowanus future are alive right now, and one of the things that's just absolutely essential to do as we try hard to make tough decisions about some really hard questions about how to confront resource allocation, about what to preserve and what to develop, about how to think about sustainability and what it's meant, um, is to grapple with and understand its past. Um, and that's what happens right here at BHS. So there's lots of different interpretations. I think there are people in this room with really strong opinions on different sides of how to think about what has mattered in the past for Gowanus, and for sure different opinions on how to carry it forward into the 21st century in a way that's mindful of its history, that preserves some of the mix that makes it great, that's inclusive of a wide range of stakeholders, past and future, that's thoughtful about sustainability, and climate change and environmental degradation, there are just not that many other places where on a warming planet, on a Superfund site, in a low-lying area prone to flooding, um, where we have historically done things which are both super energetic and job creating and inclusive, and also things which are toxic and degrading and kind of stupid in city building um, for us to think about those issues. So they're not easy questions. We'll have lots of more debates about what to do in the future, but we're really lucky to have a place in where we get to sit together and think, what are, the, are those lessons? How do we think about its history? Um, and what does it mean for us today and in the future? So I was really excited when I saw this uh, panel on the, on the list, and I said to Marsha, can I come say hello at the beginning? Um, uh, thank you guys for caring about Gowanus. Thank you for caring about Brooklyn Historical Society uh, and for being partners in making sure we make the best of Brooklyn past, present, and future. Thank you. Hey everyone, I'm Julie Golia. I'm the Director of Public History here at Brooklyn Historical Society. And as Marcia said, I am also the curator of our newest exhibition at Brooklyn Historical Society Dumbo, which is called Waterfront. Has anybody here been over to Brooklyn Historical Society Dumbo yet? All right, I'm glad to see some hands, and the next time I see you back here, I'm excited to see all of your hands up, because you've gotta go see our fantastic new location. Um, we are the only cultural institution in this remarkable 19th century warehouse along Brooklyn's waterfront, and uh, we really took that sort of mandate very seriously and committed ourselves to telling about 12,000 years of Brooklyn's waterfront history in our beautiful 3,000 square foot gallery. Um, what I'm very excited for you guys to see tonight is a little glimpse of that. Um, one of our wonderful panelists, Eric Sanderson, has been an amazing partner in our exhibition and is giving you a little sneak preview of what you will see when you go over and visit our new exhibition. 
I'm also really excited about this panel because it really does, I think as Brad says, encapsulate what we do here at Brooklyn Historical Society, which is to look at the past in order to better understand the present and act on our future. And I think our panel really encapsulate that tonight. So we've got a lot of great waterfront programming coming up here at Brooklyn Historical Society. Um, happily, we have our wonderful Dumbo location and we have this beautiful space to hold wonderful talks with people like you to talk about waterfronts past and future. We've got another event coming up next week, actually, about the history of coffee that is also tied um, to our exhibition. For now, I'm going to introduce you to our moderator of our panel tonight, and then he will introduce you to our wonderful panelists. So, Jarrett Murphy is the executive editor and publisher of City Limits, which since 1976 has published in-depth journalism on urban issues in New York City. He went to Fordham University, the London School of Economics, and the New School. Before joining City Limits in 2007, he worked for the Hartford Advocate, CBS News, and The Village Voice. He lives in the Bronx with his wife and two sons. So join me in welcoming Jarrett and our wonderful panelists. Thanks, everybody. Um, I've moderated like a dozen of these. Some of you might have seen me before. You know this is the part of the evening where typically I say something very, very pithy and witty to kind of get things going. But there have been enough preliminaries, so I know you want to hear from people who know what they're talking about, not me. So we're going to get right to that. Um, I'll introduce the panelists, and then we'll get into the, the very fascinating topic of um, the Gowanus and all the uh, other nouns that follow that, follow that word. Um, I'm joined on stage tonight by Kate Orff, who is a landscape architect and the founder of Scape, a collaborative design studio based in Lower Manhattan. Welcome, Kate. Uh, Andrea Parker, who is the executive director of the Guanas Canal Conservancy, where she works to empower a community of environmental stewards and design advocates in the Guanas watershed. Welcome. And Mr. Eric Sanderson, who is a senior conservation ecologist at the Wildlife Conservation Society and the author of the best-selling book, Manhattan, A Natural History of New York City. Why don't we welcome our panel once again. And so, you know, we're talking here about hidden waters or the hidden history and story of waters, it's hidden power. Um, it might make sense to talk about the fact that the Gowanus is obviously, if it's hidden, it's hidden in plain sight. We can see it, many of us do see it. Let's start on this end of the panel and just go down and talk relatively briefly about what do you see when you see the Gowanus? What are, we, what are you looking at um, and what do you know about that we're not seeing, Andrea? Um, I, I mean, I think that, so I've been involved in the Gowanus for about seven years, and I think the thing that I see the most is the change, is the amount of change that's happened in that time. Specifically, I'm a gardener, I focus on plants, and I see the amount of feral plants that we've lost in those seven years, but also the new plants that are being grown by our organization and by um, new development. <laughs> um, I mean, it's funny, you, one of the most striking uh, moments that I saw in the Gowanus Canal, this is probably maybe nine or ten years ago, was um, seeing a horseshoe crab crawling, trying to get up uh, against, uh, to lay an egg against a vertical uh, bulkhead wall mm -hmm. and being incredibly struck by that. And, and then, you know, I guess the other thing um, in terms of almost personally, you know, my father, um, you know, grew up in Queens and, and, and his experience was really Newtown Creek and how incredible, like just to think about the in incredible um, uh, intensity of industry that, that happened during this period of time in the city, which, you know, Newtown Creek and Gowanus kind of share that history. How extraordinary it is that, uh, you know, now that after his death, we are talking about housing, we're talking about new landscapes, we are talking about this incredible change that Andrea mentioned. Um, so that kind of, um, along with the feral plants, this kind of uh, need or this kind of uh, ability for life to persist and want to want to come back in these landscapes is what I see uh, alongside this incredible kind of uh, what is very seemingly rapid uh, transformation from that economy that was so incredibly heavily industrial and, and, and which is now kind of in the spirit of, of rapid, rapid change and transition. Do you think that horseshoe crab had been priced out of Manhattan? Or <laughs> that that horseshoe crab is priced there. out of uh, the Rockaways. Many places, yeah. yes. Yeah. 
Uh, so Eric, I think your answer might be a little longer in terms of what you think of and see when you see the, the Gowanus. Well, I guess when I'm walking around there, I don't see a canal, I see a creek. Mm-hmm. You know, I sort of kind of look through the infrastructure that's there and all the changes and, and try and imagine what was there, you know, for thousands and thousands of years before all those changes happen, all those rapid changes mm-hmm. and those rapid changes that are coming in the future. And so I see the waters coming in or, or the wildlife. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's just like Kate said, you know, it's like it's trying to break through and it's so constrained by decisions that people made um, in the past. And I'm, I'm optimistic about the changes that we can make for the future of the city. Um, and frankly, I also think that nature is forcing our hand with sea level rise that's so important and the low-lying parts of our city, which is you know, obviously very true for Kiwanis and Red Hook, but true for many other parts of New York City and indeed for coastal cities all over the world. So take us deeper into that backstory. I know you have some, yeah. some pictures yeah, you want to I, show us. I prepared a few, just a few illustrations for the audience. Um, you know, whenever I think about the waters of a place, the invisible waters, you have to talk first about the visible waters. And the water comes from somewhere, and it comes from the climate. And so um, I like just think it's important to remember that we live in actually a very fortunate place in terms of its climate. So the, the graph above is the average monthly precipitation in New York City. And you can see it's very even over the course of the year. Mm-hmm. I'm originally from California where you know it rains in the winter and then from April till September it doesn't rain at all and not, not a drop. And um, that makes it very hard for the plants and animals that live there. But that's not true for the Northeast. That's not true for New York City. Um, and then the other thing that's important to say about the water is it, 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 you know, I don't have to remind you, but it gets very cold in the wintertime here. And we get average temperatures that are below freezing, and that leads to snow. And that has really important consequences for the ecosystems and for the species. If you, you know, either you have to have adaptations to live here through, you know, the tropical summers and the frigid winters, or you have to leave, you know, so that's why we have so many migratory species that come and, and go through, through the city. Um, and it also means that, you know, insect life and some things that aren't adapted to that can't persist here. So it actually helps it make it a very healthy environment. Um, um, But of course, the climate changes. Mm -hmm. And um, one way to see that is through this graph. This is actually a a measure of drought from tree rings. And it's 500, almost 550 years long. It's from Ed Cook at Lamont Doherty, who's a dendrochronologist. A dendrochronologist, somebody who takes tree rings, or takes cores and trees and counts the rings. And the width of the ring is actually an indication of how much water there is. And you do this in a bunch of places. This one's for the lower Hudson River Valley. And you get this drought stress index. So lines above above the the black line, that's uh, years with good water. And then below is drought years. And you can see that there have been times in the past where there have been 50-year droughts in this region. Even you know the 1960s right here was actually a kind of extraordinary drought for New York City. So even though we often you know talk about you know as I just did what a great climate we have, our climate is also has changed in the past and is going to continue to change going into the future, and that has consequences for for the waters. Mm. Um, so here's the here's the video that we mentioned. So. Um, Preview. Yep, yep. So, <laughs> so this is um, a video. If you go down to the waterfront exhibit, we're just not going to see the whole thing, just the first couple of minutes. But this tells a really important mm-hmm. geologic story, which I think is actually essential to understanding how Brooklyn works. So, if you wouldn't mind, Maestro. What we experience is centuries, amounts to just seconds on the cosmic clock of stone. Where you now stand was once covered by roughly 2,000 feet of ice and rock. Close your eyes, and perhaps you can hear it. The pops and cracks like the firing of cannon as the story's high sheet begins melting and cleaving. The rush of meltwater honeycombing its underside, the loud tumbling of strange northern rocks as at last they're released from the ice's great body to begin to rebuild their new home.
As the ice melts, a glacial lake fills, engulfing hills and valleys. A succession of ice dams break. Fresh water bursts out toward the ocean. As sea levels rise, familiar coastlines emerge. Lenape Hoking. When the Europeans first started coming up our river, they first met us and they asked, how many people in your tribe? And we never knew how to answer that because to us, the trees, the stones, the deer are part of our tribe. That's Kiwanis, that's Kiwanis Creek. We can stop there, if you want to mind. Great, thank you, thank you. So, um, we, we can just move over to the next slide. So there's a couple, I think, important points underneath that, that video, which is really beautiful and, and goes on and takes you through the entire history of Brooklyn. So if you get a chance, go down to the Empire Stores and check it out. Um, but one thing is to say that we live in a glaciated landscape. So 20,000 years ago, there was ice right here, right here, and not, not a little ice, thousands of feet of ice that created you know, the terminal moraine, Park Slope, and um, Crown Heights, and so forth. And, you know, that glaciation is just the last in between 60 and 70 glaciations that have happened over the last two million years. So it's very important that, like, where we are here, everything about our current, well, not everything, but a lot about our current geology depends on that, particularly the geology of water. And then when the glaciers retreated, they didn't just retreat all at once, whoosh, you know, they slowly moved backwards. And as they moved backwards and melted all over the world, the sea level rose. And so at the height of the glaciation, the sea level, the sea was 120 miles from here and 120 feet lower. And then it moved in. I mean, 120, meter, 120 meters lower, sorry, 120 meters. And then slowly it moved in as the ice sheets all over the world melted. So when we think about the meter of sea level rise, it's going to happen in the 21st century, or a meter and a half. We have to take into account that the ecosystems around here are already adapted to 120 meters of sea level rise, right? And nothing stood in the way. The beaches and the shores and the salt marshes that used to be on the river's edge, or on the sea's edge, moved all the way back to where they were when Henry Hudson showed up and met the Lenape, as in that last scene from our, our work on the Wilikia project. Um, and you can see that actually in this plot here. This is from a paper about the groundwater of Long Island. And uh, sorry, it's a little awkward to point, but um, this is this is a sort of a cut through the middle of um, of Queens and then down here in Brooklyn. But it'd be similar if we took the the section through Gowanus Creek here. Um, there's bedrock underneath Long Island, but it's diving down. So when you get out to the JFK Airport, it's a thousand feet below the surface. And then what's on top of that are these, um, these beds of gravel and silt and clay that create aquifers. Mm. And so the groundwater system of Long Island is hugely important for the way that the, the streams and the springs of this part of the world used to work. Very different, actually, than what's going on in Manhattan or Staten Island or the Bronx historically. Those are mostly surface-fed systems, you know, very close to the bedrock. But here you have all this other sediment on top. Um, and that's actually what leads you to, um, to, to Kiwanis Creek and why we have salt marshes. It's the combination of the glacial action and then the, um, that leads to the elevation, the rising sea levels, and then the groundwater system. And so this is the Ratzer plan. Um, there's a beautiful copy that's here in the Brooklyn Historical Society. Uh, 1767, this is a colonial era British map. Very, very important of Brooklyn. Probably the most important map. I don't know, you could ask Julie. I think it's the most important map. Uh, and you can see this is Gowanus Creek. This is the Gowanus uh, salt marsh system. This this is Red Hook here. Um, you can see where the, the farm fields are, right? The farm fields are going to be above the tidal range. These salt marshes are in the intertidal zone. Um, and we have, I have a couple here. I just have a sequence of maps, and then I'll hand over to my colleagues. Um, this is a similar map. This is Sproul's map, 1781, made by a British Army cartographer. Mm -hmm. Um, Brooklyn, even in 1781, was very important for the British, not only for defensive purposes, but as a memory of their great win at the, the Battle of Brooklyn Heights in 1776. 
Um, or this map, this is a little piece of the British headquarters map, which I wrote a lot about for Manhattan, but there's an extension of it down here in, in Brooklyn, Brooklyn Heights. This is actually my, my favorite, of course. Um, and you can see the hills right around here. You can see the hills over here, and you can see the low-lying salt marshes and the tidal creeks that infuse here. So these are mostly um, saltwater creeks. They're filling on the uptide, on the, you know, on the, the flowing tide coming in and the tide going out. They move both ways or two-way uh, hydrologic systems. And then I have a series of historical maps from the 19th century. So, you know, just as um, Kate and Andrea, you know, mentioned, we're going through this rapid industrial, mm -hmm. uh, rapid change right now. But actually, it's, I don't know if it's anything compared to what happened in the 19th century. It's actually very quick that it got messed up really mm -hmm. badly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so this map is 1844. This sort of stippling is showing the salt marshes here. You can see the, the fields in Korea. It's all agriculture now. Everywhere you can have agriculture except on the hills. That's the Atlantic Dock. Mm -hmm. um, this is just a few years later, 1853. And you can see it's already, the city's moved down. The agriculture's been gridded out for the street network. This is uh, 1882, 1907. Notice it's being filled over here on Governor's Island. Yeah. That's from the construction of the subway. Uh, 1924, where is Gowanus Creek? And today. So it's a remarkable transformation of the landscape. How did it, so the, the initial um, messing up, as you, as you referred to, I'm not sure <laughs> yeah. which one. So was that um, accidental in the sense that there was fill and other stuff being dredged up by the city building itself elsewhere and the Gowanus was just a convenient place to dump it? Or were, they, were folks back then con consciously trying to create new livable land where it is now? Well, what you, what you see, you can see how the development patterns, you know, were first on the upland, right? You're gonna put your houses on the upland, not in the flood zone. And then later during the industrial period, and this is true for mm -hmm. Newtown Creek too, you know, where are you gonna put these industries that are close to the water, but now all the upland's kind of taken. So the place was the salt marshes because the salt marshes weren't appreciated for their ecological value. And you can actually see that in this modern photo. Whoops, sorry, this modern photo here. You can see, do you see the like morphology of the buildings? Like here, around here, like the old factory buildings are bigger. And that line is basically the salt marsh line, right? And that line is also the current manufacturing zone. Okay. Which is, right. so you in, looked at for city planning, but for potential rezoning. Yeah, so and you can see this too for Newtown Creek or Westchester Creek mm -hmm. in the Bronx, that um, you know the salt marshes were kind of the last place to be filled. And that's because it was the empty space, the only available space. And it was, you know, it was expensive for them to do it. And then, of course, the industries that they brought were often, you know, heavily polluting because they didn't have proper pollution controls and so forth. Andrea, we were talking or emailing earlier in the week about like all the different, like, you know, we watched their uh, time-lapse film that covered a few tens of thousands of years. And obviously there's alteration occurring there, but a different kind of alteration that has been visited on the, the canal and the creek and continues to this day. And, and it takes a lot of different forms, right? Do you want to talk about that at all? Um, in terms of the, how the hydrology has yes, altered exactly. in particular. Yeah, actually, if I could, thank you. Um, well, I mean, first of all, I just wanted to yeah. give you that visual of mm -hmm. what the canal looked like in yeah. those busy industrial days. Mm -hmm. And yes, it was in order to get closer to the canal, but it was also in order to get goods to the larger city. We really say that the canal built Brooklyn. Essentially, all of the materials that were used to build Park Slope, Cobble Hill were brought some of them many all like down the Erie Canal up the Gowanus Canal. It was at one point the busiest industrial canal in America. Um, and that industry caused an enormous amount of contamination at the bottom of the canal. Um, so the hydrology of the canal, yes, it used to be this sort of shallow salt marsh with lots of fresh water flowing into it from upland creeks. Mm. It is currently a um, relatively deep, about 15 feet on average, deep um, waterway with about 10 feet of contaminated sediment from historic industry at the, the bottom of black it. Black mayonnaise. Black right? mayonnaise is what it's called. <laughs> and it's like this really viscous, uh, <laughs> sticky black substance that's from coal tar from manufactured mm -hmm. gas plants, and it sinks down into the ground. It's extremely carcinogenic. But there's also a lot of poop going into the canal every time it rains. So. In, um, here we go. In New York City, we have a combined sewer system. Um, so all of our, you know, back in the day when we had this natural 
um, water body and watershed, water would flow down the hills into the creeks and directly into the canal. Now all of that water flows directly into the sewer system. It's the same pipe system that collects everything you flush down your toilets or pour down your drains. Um, and the pipe system isn't large enough to manage all of that mass. So essentially every time it rains, raw sewage overflows into the Gowanus Canal. And that watershed area, the area, and Ooh. this is, uh, this this is, is a good a, visual. Is video. <laughs> <laughs> I don't actually have the video. Oh, I recommend you, you gotta all see the video. Google it, yeah, yeah. Konami. Um, it is a really incredible it's vision a of a broad front <laughs> tide of poop uh, tide of poop. <laughs> yeah. Um, there we go. But it, the, the, that sewage, all of that inflow is really coming from the watershed. It's actually the, the topographic area that used to drain directly into the canal that stretches up to Prospect Park on the west, over into Cobble Hill. We're just out of it here. Basically, Atlantic Avenue is the boundary. Um, there's a lot of areas of Brooklyn that don't actually feel that physical connection to the canal, but are literally draining directly into it. Um, and I think that that's, so yes, we, there used to be this, you know, sort of tidal inflow and fresh water coming from the hills. There's still fresh water, it's just actual sewage. <laughs> but the, the ecology is remarkably similar, and fauna knows that. Flora and fauna right. knows that, and exists there. Kate, as a designer who, you know, obviously your designs are, are forward-looking, but yeah. informed by this past, I'm, you know, here's a... a hopelessly broad question, but how, do, how are we supposed to think about the history that shaped Gowanus? Are we supposed to regret it? I mean, it's a little, it's a little as existential, right? Like, we wouldn't be here without it. And, and this right, is just right. what we do. Like, cities always mess up their water. Chicago, reverse the flow of the Chicago River. Yeah. You know, New Orleans, we all know the story there. The Harlem River was diverted, basically, to create Manhattan, Bronx borders, you know, today, yeah. and that's just sort of like the way it is. So how are we supposed yeah, to think yeah. about the past and what we've done in these right, places? Right. We do always mess up our water. <laughs> that's something that I think is characterizes modernization. Um, but I, one thing I wanted to say um, that, that was evident in, in Eric's map is, you know, when I, when I see the representations of the Manhattan style, too, I, I also, you talk about invisible, I also see the Native American kind of community and or, or uh, settlement in that picture, right? Because mm -hmm. even um, um, these were highly managed landscapes. Forests were managed. Farming took place within forest, you know, within uh, the forest canopy. Um, there was, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, fishing and operations and giant oyster middens. Um, so, I mean, I guess. I guess our role as, as designers is to try to pull these worlds together and to try to make it not like a, uh, you know, standoff to the death where uh, humans are left standing and the rest of the natural world is, is not. Um, and to try to weave these systems back together. And of course, that's a tall order, right? Because you're talking about levels of densification um, in Manhattan or in, in New York now that sort of defy you know, the ability to kind of mediate an urban ecology or an urban natural system. But that, that basically was our goal with the Lowlands plan, was to chart it. And I think I have an image of it. This is an image of the stormwater. I'll just flip through just so I can have something in the background. This is the, do you want to say any more about any yeah, of this? Yeah, go for it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so, so talk about, I, I think one of the many reasons why we have messed up our water bodies is that our methodology is land-based and um, uh, architecture-based, developer-based, parcelization. These are the kinds of um, methods that we now use to plan cities. And so, what we started with, with the Gowanus Lowlands Plan, which is a plan which is aiming to be not a plan, but a kind of a forum for dialogue around the future of the Gowanus itself that is meant to kind of capture and translate many of the aspirations that we heard and, and GCC and other organizations heard over many years and try to capture them within you know, a space or within a vision so that they can kind of continue to debate uh, that, uh, that, that future. Um, we, we began to 
start that process by looking at water. And so the image that you see uh, on the uh, screen now is probably very similar to the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the Ratzer map. It literally is this kind of historic drainage pattern overlaid on top of the kind of current um, built fabric. And, and you can really see that, of course, you know, there's a, in a funny way, there's a, there's a tag that's called mud flats, and it's probably somebody's house, maybe someone in this room, right? But the, the reality is, is these are these historic ecosystems that existed on a gradient. And right now, we have um, flattened them, we have canalized them, we have changed that uh, uh, gradient, uh, intertidal gradient, into a vertical line, that bulkhead that the horseshoe crab was trying to climb up. So we began the, the process of the, the, the plan and kind of called it the lowlands because now I'm appreciating the, the kind of you know, geological framework of time that, that Eric put forward, but I do feel like that the uh, climate change and the sort of increasing uh, speed of sea level rise, the rapidity of sea level rise, and the increasing threats from hurricanes and other extreme weather now kind of puts us on a different scale. It's some an accelerant, right? Um, and so um, what we have now, and this is just an overlay of today's hydrology, which is a highly managed hydrology, poop, in, in addition to um, uh, street sewers, right, this kind of overlay of, of human infrastructure, those together kind of form the, the, the lowlands kind of blueprint for, as a starting point for um, our, our goals for the plan, which was to kind of create an, a cleaner urban ecosystem, generate a community connector, develop a network of parks, and foster uh, uh, the whole space as an urban waterway. So, you know, how do you do that, right? Because people are living alongside bicycles, cars, um, active businesses. Um, and so we began to kind of overlay all these systems and try to understand, you know, how not in a form of a historic salt marsh, but how could you begin to modify edges to create um, spaces for intertidal uh, 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 movement of water? How could you um, reimagine a street as a stormwater, um, you know, as you see here, right, as a sort of a stormwater uh, flow uh, uh, area? How could we begin to daylight streams within a building here? Um, how can we kind of improve water quality through a whole suite of landscape interventions, landscape-driven interventions that include, you know, very technical things like contiguous street, pit, street tree pits and uh, stormwater gardens, et cetera. And so this is a sort of a, a, a vision for, you know, um, almost like a retroactive park, right, within this very dense, very, you know, active neighborhood um, that would somehow um, begin to knit uh, a whole series of kind of political and economic and development and industry actors uh, together to kind of, um, you know, put this put this vision forward and kind of adapt it. Um, so so that's, that's really what um, the role of design is in this case, is to try to synthesize this feedback and the needs of not just natural systems, but also human communities, economic um, uh, imperatives, et cetera. So that's our sort of image of our, our lowlands plan. And, and just I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up here. But I think w one thing I wanted to mention um, relative to the salt marsh and this kind of um, the evolving salt marsh is that, you know, before we messed up our waterways by straightening uh, and dredging and uh, 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 sort of um, harvesting oysters and, and shellfish to a, a point where they could not uh, subsist, um, we, we need to recreate uh, these edges now um, because sea level rise is happening and there is not space in the urban uh, profile for these kinds of uh, uh, systems to migrate inward. So a lot of the work that we've done on the, uh, on the Lowlands plan is to try to evolve um, different forms of edges that could um, both do this joint thing that we're talking about, which is um, increase sort of space for e e ecosystems to migrate, whether through floating islands or through stepping down edges. Um, or to, um, and, and that these um, uh, new edges can also then accommodate social life. So it's again this kind of knitting together of the ecological and, and social imperatives. So that's basically um, the this, this sort of goals of the plan. Um, Eric, before we leave uh, history behind and talk about present and future, I'm just, I'm curious that- Can we leave history behind? <laughs> I don't know. We are at the, I tried all my life. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's why the alias is there. But. Uh, 
the, the creek that you see, you see it in the sense that you knew it was there at one point, but it's also, it's, it's still kind of there, right? Like there's, I've heard that if you put your ear to the ground, you can still hear water moving in some places, and we see basement flooding. Like the water, we don't see it, and we've tried to cover it up and like kill it, but the water's, the water's still there, right? In some form. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it still rains. Still snows, but you'll remember it snowed this um, this winter, mm-hmm. right? And that water needs to go someplace. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I agree with what Andrea and Kate were saying. You know, the the thing about the water system is it's not perfect. So it is true we have a combined sewer system, but it's also true those pipes leak. Mm-hmm. And when they leak, where does the water go? It follows gravity as it always has, and it tends to flow in the places it used to flow, mm-hmm. um, which you know in this case is the groundwater, and that of course pushes some of that pollution that's now in the way down into the canal, which is the lowest point. Mm-hmm. So. Um, which is exactly why the Superfund project and everything to try and clean it up is so important. Um, but that's right, the, you know, water does what water will do, and there's nothing we really can do to stop it. We can manipulate it, you know, we can like, you know, cement over our cities, as we've had, and then create floods that way. We can build, you know, pipe systems that cost us billions of dollars to maintain and to run. Um, or we can open up the ground and let the ground do it for free. And I mean, I think that that's a big reason why we brought on Scape mm-hmm. to work on the Lowlands Plan is that we think there's a smarter way to do this. Um, I mean, right now, the the city responsible parties for the industrial pollution and private developers are all investing an enormous amount of money in Gowanus. Um, we think that money could be spent to actually make the ecosystem work. And it won't do that without a cohesive plan and without mm-hmm. landscape architects mm-hmm. to guide that. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're really, I mean, we're looking for you know places where you can daylight a stream for the same amount of money that it would take to um, make something that would that would manage much less storm water. Like, what are the, like the high value projects for lower dollars that can be used that can be leveraged through these processes? Is there still uh, an opportunity to incorporate that stuff in the oh, yeah. Superfund. So talk more about where we are <laughs> well, in the not process. Super fun. And, not right, in Superfund. Not in Superfund. But that's the, the goal. Right, right. So the, there's several processes going on in the neighborhood right now. There's the Superfund, which is the, the mm-hmm. cleanup of the bottom of the canal. The Superfund, there's also a um, natural restoration damages assessment that will happen as part of the Superfund. And that's an opportunity to build restoration projects. So we're advocating heavily for those. Um, the city planning framework that's moving through right now um, will probably rezone most of the waterfront. So we're working on the master plan that we're working on is coming up with recommendations for what that waterfront should space should, should be like and how it should perform. But the rezoning also needs to come with investment in neighborhood infrastructure. So we're coming up with key projects that the city can invest in that will make this hydrology work mm-hmm. better. Mm-hmm. Um, relevant to the rezoning and, you know, what I cover nine to five is mainly affordable housing. Mm-hmm. And I wonder the, the changes to the edges that the, your plan talks about. And I think, mm-hmm. you know, the, the water is going to force on us one way or the other. Um, it suggests that that's going to mean, you know, less, less land that we can safely mm-hmm. build upon. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, does that pose, you know, changes demographically to a neighborhood? Does that Mm -hmm. pose a threat of gentrification, Mm -hmm. displacement? Mm -hmm. How does the the kind of, you know, water tide mix with the human tide going in and out Mm -hmm. of Brooklyn, Mm -hmm. do you see? Do you want to take that one? Or I can can talk about the edges, but why don't you talk about that? I mean, I I think it's key to us. We're seeing that most new development is going to be high, but that the landscape can Mm -hmm. be low. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that it's uninhabitable. It can have, you know, boardwalks on top of it that you can Mm -hmm. get up onto or other ways to raise above it. But I don't, I think that this vision and Mm -hmm. sort of this way of innovating in design is not saying let's abandon our waterways, but saying like, let's live with them in a way where our landscape can actually absorb those floodwaters. Mm I mean, I, I, I want to talk about this image in a minute, but um, one other part that Eric mentioned that I think is relevant here is you mentioned building morphology, too. I think that's one of the challenges, right, is that there are very large parcels now along the, the Gowanus, and what's happening is they're changing. Uh, oh, they have changed ownership very rapidly. So um, we're talking about there is a different scale of development that is potentially coming online. I mean, there are buildings there now, I'm sure many of you, <laughs> that, that kind of are a prefiguration of the, the, the future. Um, 
Um, so what that means for affordability, I'm not sure. From, a, from, a, from the standpoint of, of physical urban form, it's going to be quite a, a different kind of demographic shift uh, and influx. Um, so, you know, from the, from the standpoint of edge, you know, do I, is there a kind of a, a standoff? Is there a kind of a red line? I mean, one of the things that is, it can really help mediate that is this kind of waterfront access plan concept, which is the, the notion of, um, you know, we're not addressing density or zoning or any of these, these issues, but we, what we are trying to very focus on with a kind of laser-like precision is the, 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 the quality of the ground and the, the literally the three-dimensional articulation of the landscape. Because the worst case scenario is the vertical bulkhead the tall tower, the, the piece of ground that's elevated to elevation 15 while everybody else is down at six or seven, and then you have these kind of uncoordinated parcel by parcel development where everybody's kind of in it for themselves, you know? Mm -hmm. So really what the, what the leadership of, of Andrea has, has brought to the table is this notion that um, even though we're trying to accept the reality of this development context, can you get in front of that process and can you put forward a vision that uh, multiple stakeholders can buy into that then creates a knitted kind of much more co co contiguous and cohesive mm -hmm. landscape, which is sort of the name of the game and, and landscape is kind of contiguity um, that, that uh, can survive, you know, um, uh, you know, can receive future sea level rise, but also kind of acknowledge this, this, this new kind of um, uh, social sort of life that's going to be emerging there. So most of the pictures um, of the vision are of people, you know, right. recreating right. Um, near the water. And I'm wondering, obviously it was traditionally, and the reason we're talking about it uh, being polluted is it was an industrial area. Mm -hmm. There are people who would like to see a resurgence and who see there is one going on of, of manufacturing industry mm -hmm. in the city. Mm -hmm. It probably, hopefully, won't be as polluting, but it, it might well make use of the water again. I mean, the city has gone in recent years from you know hauling its garbage out exclusively by long distance truck and doing it on, by barge and instead yeah, there might yeah. be other. So is there room for having this kind of you know soft edge on the water and making mm -hmm. room for potential return of industry? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll turn it to one of you, but I, I think that's what this image is kind of trying to show, which is this hybrid nature. I think one thing that is is clear is that one at the Brooklyn Historic Society, it's not you know the purpose is not like erasing from one era to another. That there's this you know this is basically a bridge a bridging process to a future that is absolutely enabling kind of on the right side of that image an industrial kind of warehouse or water uh, industrial you know productive waterfront to continue. But on the left side of the image is much more ecologically productive waterfront. So. Um, in a way, one would hope that they do not exist fully at the expense of each other. And I think probably most people in this room would agree that you know, the, the absolute transition into a kind of a simple, you know, like industry to housing is, is the absolute not way to, to go in this, in this landscape. It's not um, resilient from an, an ecosystem standpoint. It's not resilient from a, a, an economic standpoint even so. Mm -hmm. I have one more question that I'm going I, to... Can I just, yeah, go ahead. just say one thing, which is, um, you know, I know that that is the story, that the tradition is industry, but remember, that's only maybe 50 or 75 years in a mm -hmm. history that's tens of thousands of years long. Mm -hmm. the, the most important tradition is actually the forest and wetland tradition, mm -hmm. right? I mean, and then we made it a city, and for a long time, that part of the city was agricultural, mm -hmm. you know? It was pastoral, right? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it's really this very short period of time and the sort of, you know, from 1850, from the Civil War maybe, you know, into the early 20th century that it's industrial in a terrible kind of way, right? And then that industry moved and left its legacy and nobody paid to clean up the, the mistakes they made, right? So, you know, I think it's really important that we, you know, that is an important part of the history, but it's not the only part of the history, or even, I would argue, even the most important part of the history, mm -hmm. you know? And, you know, the, all these things about history that are all just pre, presaging the future, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I, 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 you know I, I like to think about the decisions that we make that are the history for the future, right? 
Like, you know, people made decisions to do those things in the past, and there was a political and a social process to make that happen, and we are participants in a political and social process. It's not just about our time. It's about what are we giving to the future, mm -hmm. and that's what's so, you know, wonderful mm -hmm. about these designs that, mm -hmm. that Kate's showing here, is they, they are really things that give to the future and give opportunity to the future instead of foreclosing opportunities for the future. So just a housekeeping note, I'm going to ask one more question that open it up for your questions. So if you have one, please think of it, and there'll be uh, mics <laughs> circulating, or yes. Um, so speaking of the future, that tees up the question of um, the canal slash creek as an educational yeah. tool, mm -hmm. right? Because a big part of this is trying to inculcate you know, some yes. sense of our relationship with the water. Um, Andrea, I, I, can you talk about what, you, what is its potential as a, as a classroom? I mean, it's enormous. It is a classroom right now. We use it as a classroom, you know, every week, every, every Wednesday, come down and see students doing water quality testing mm -hmm. um, and learning about the pollution in the canal and what they can do about it. Um, we, so Gowanus Canal Conservancy has a really active and engaged volunteer program and education um, program that engages about 2,000 folks a year in kind of coming up with sort of small ecological projects that can be implemented with, you know, cheaply and can sort of test out ideas for these larger visions, um, understanding what actually is going on in the canal and what can be done about it. Um, and sort of artistic projects, how can you envision, you know, this is one of those underground creeks, how can we actually paint that in the sidewalk and start bringing it to life and start understanding the watershed as a whole. Um, I think that it's going to be critical to continue these efforts, especially as the canal gets clean, because it's only going to stay clean if we, if everyone in the watershed mm -hmm. actually takes part in keeping it clean. Um, the work that the city's doing, Right now, there's about 370 million gallons of combined sewage going into the canal. After mm. the city does the work they're going to do, there's going to be about 115 a year. That's still a lot of sewage. And it's really up to everyone in the watershed to do their part, to mm. not do laundry during a storm or you know, put in a little rain barrel. Or <laughs> mm. <laughs> there's there's something yellow, that each of us can mellow, do. Kind of thing, exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Exactly. Um, words to live by. So, <laughs> questions from the crowd, and, and we are asking for questions, not comments or speeches or lyrical poetry. <laughs> and I, I, I'm capable poetry. of being extremely rude. So, let's start. Was there any over here? Front row. Looks like they're okay, excited. Uh, okay. uh, Carroll Street Bridge. What are plans for that and the other two bridges? Carroll Street Bridge is um, it's a historic landmark. It is definitely going to stay. I mean, I'm sure they're going to need to do some repairs to it at some point, but it's in pretty good shape. Union Street Bridge um, was really badly damaged by Sandy, um, so they are looking to replace it either with a fixed bridge um, or a movable bridge. The fixed bridge is a lot cheaper, but they wouldn't be able to move it to dredge out the head of the canal. So they're probably going to finish the dredging first and then make the decision about whether it'll be fixed or movable. That was a perfectly composed question, perfect length. <laughs> Round of applause Stay, for my friend. You rarely see that in the panel world, my friend up here. Great answer, too. Yeah. Yeah. Every, few years, every few years, the politicians keep talking about something called the Flushing Tunnel, mm -hmm. oh, which yeah. is supposedly going to clean the Gowanus Canal. Oh. Yeah. Right now, it seems to be silence. No one talks about the flushing yeah, tunnel any go. longer. Right. What about this flushing yeah. tunnel? And what's being done to hold the politicians accountable? So the, the flushing tunnel was fixed. It's that yellow arrow right there, and it brings cleaner water from the East River into the canal and pushes it out. And that's because, because it's a really long, skinny body of water, it doesn't move very well, and it really needs that pressure um, to help push it out. Um, Wasn't so, that originally in 1911 or something? Yeah. It's actually quite, and then it was repaired. And then it was and broke and it was repaired. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was repaired. That's why they're not talking about it anymore. The other reason they're not talking about it is that it's causing this really disgusting thing that's called the Gowanus milkshake effect huh? that canoers of the audience Anyone? will know well. <laughs> um, and it's essentially, it's, there's all this highly oxygenated water coming out, and it's stirring up all of the combined sewage overflow that comes out, so all of the sudsing agents you throw down your mm. sink. And so there's these bubbles, this like cream, this cappuccino basically floating down the head of the canal. <laughs> That's why they're not talking about it. Nice. <laughs> That's vivid. Uh, yeah. Back there. What are the details with regard to the Superfund cleanup? Sorry, the, the details? Yeah, I, yeah. How much is planned to remove the 
um, it's it's mostly planned. Um, so right now, basically the 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 um, process is shoring up the sides of the canal, um, which means that all of those sort of soft edges mm -hmm. where you do see some mussels growing, et cetera, are going to be steel bulkheads. Um, they are then going to, and that's the, it, that's order to keep the land up so they can dredge out that 10 feet of contaminated sediment. It's like then a, a secondary wall in front of it, right? Exactly. Keep going there, and yeah. then they'll put down this multi-layered cap. Um, so right now, they're testing that whole process in the, um, the area right behind the Whole Foods on 3rd and 3rd. Um, so if you go down there now, you'll see a ton of cranes and barges in the turning basin. They're going to see whether they can get it all right there, and then they'll start at the head of the canal. They're estimating right now it'll be done at like 2025, mm -hmm. but we'll see. Right. It's, I think it's important to say it's mostly dredging the canal. There's not necessarily land, you know, land-based kind of remediation going. It's is mostly it, the, the, ma the black mayonnaise, right? Yes, exactly, exactly. Is it being put on it, or is it being dredged out? It's being, so the, the totally contaminated sediment's being dredged out, and then there's about 100 feet of slightly contaminated native sediment, and that is being capped. And then why don't you uh, sort of finish the thought that the, the icky stuff they pick up from the dredging goes, goes where? What happens to that? The icky stuff goes to some poor place that we pay to take it from us. And that is a big problem with remediation of toxic sites right now. Right. We can afford to ship off our trash to someone else. I think it's going to Pennsylvania. Um, it's gonna, and it's going to go to a landfill. It's going to be contained, but it's still, it's still going to exist. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's why... There are other technologies that we could be using that would take a lot longer to treat it in place. Um, and it's the reason why we should maybe think about using some of those in Newtown Creek instead of just shipping it away. Mm -hmm. um, what's being capped with? Something like clay? If the hydrology is such that the water's still seeping up, mm -hmm. I would think that you want that cap to be pretty firm. Yeah. Uh, so what's it being capped with? There's like, I think it's like five layers. There's a concrete. Um, Clay, there's some sort of retardant, um, and then there's like a really just like a habitat layer on top, which mm -hmm. is just some sand. Um, but yes, there's a lot of stuff that's trying to push that contamination down. You can do your own uh, EPA uh, community meeting. <laughs> you, you should you should be on like their fun. on their roster. Um, I've been to enough. <laughs> yeah. Oh, over here. Um, I was curious about um, the building along the canal. I know um, there is that massive um, housing development between um, President Street and I guess it's second place. Now, what about the rest of the land down by uh, Smith and Ninth? What's, what's going to happen? There are so many rumors going around about what's going to be built. Mm -hmm. Do you have any information about that? Yeah, so the most of the north of the canal is being looked at right now by the city for a potential rezoning. Um, essentially, about um, half of the canal is a protected industrial business zone, um, and it's on the slide. So right where the canal bends, the stuff that's to the, um, the top of the slide mm -hmm. will stay industrial. And IBZ, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then everything on the north is probably going to be rezoned. Um, it's on the list that the mayor wants to put more affordable housing into this neighborhood. Um, so we're assuming there's going to be a lot of high density affordable housing. Um, the community really wants to see more mixed use, more space for artists, um, more community spaces. And that is, um, Brad put together a fantastic planning process called Bridging Gowanus mm -hmm. um, that really pulled out a lot of those priorities and city planning is looking at them and trying to integrate them into the zoning plan. Who owns that land? Most of the land right now is owned by major developers. There's been an enormous amount of real estate speculation in the area, um, and most of it is owned by people who are planning to develop when the zoning goes through. I'm very disappointed by this other side of the room. You know, I mean, <laughs> yeah, come on. these guys are, all right, we have, there there's go. somebody. Over there in the I knew there was someone. I've seen folks in the canal doing measurements. What's happening with the Billion Oyster Project? Mm. 
Um, so there, there is one small billion oyster installation um, that MS-51 did over by Whole Foods, actually. Um, mm -hmm. it's, they're testing it to see whether it works. There definitely are some oysters in the canal, but it's not quite clean enough to really, um, to really work. But maybe you mm -hmm. can talk about the fuzzy ropes. Well, yeah, and I see a, a, a partner, Bart Chesner, in the office, in the, in the audience, too, that can talk to this. But um, um, we actually applied to do uh, some oyster baskets, and we had that uh, uh, permit um, uh, denied uh, due to water quality issues. So Billion, I'm on the board of Billion Oyster Project now, and it's an amazing o organization. Um, they have incredibly successful pilots in a lot of places that you would not expect um, uh, all around the New York Harbor. I would say Gowanus is not one of them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's generally true oysters require a little bit of fresh water, right, yeah. to be most successful. Right. And, and I, I think back in the maps that you showed, it was some sort, I mean, like the, the Gowanus was a kind of a um, magical uh, mixture yeah. of the right kind of fresh and salt. Um, uh, so uh, although history uh, had it as being one of the most uh, abundant sort of oyster uh, uh, landscapes, it is no longer that. Yeah, there were yeah. two ministers in 1679, Julie, right? Who, uh, who wrote about having a meal and eating Gowanus oysters. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, Bart wants to respond. Oh, there's Bart. Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. Hold on. Go there and then we'll come I, I, promise. I just want to say that in Gowanus Bay, not too far yeah, from the outside. Gowanus Canal, in a Bush Terminal Park, there's a very successful installation of oysters. And for the most part, they, uh, they'll grow. The, the water quality there is sufficient for them to be quite successful. Not reef shed, but as the water quality improves towards the canal, uh, I think they'll be able to do something uh, closer to that location. Mm -hmm. Right, where there's more water and flushing and, uh, and movement, uh, they're Will more successful. Right, no, and, and we worked with actually Bart, um, uh, I don't know, six years ago or something, about uh, trying to do a kind of a pilot for mussel growth and oyster growth in the, uh, at the Sims Pier out in the, the, the Gowanus Bay, which was successful. But. Not, not yes. <laughs> you keep mentioning the city, the city, the city. Which level of government is ultimately responsible for this? City, state, or federal? That, they all are. They all are. Yeah. <laughs> if That's they what's all so are, confusing. Then no one is responsible. That's, That's what you're really saying. It is. It's a constant. Yes. There's. There's. A, to a very much of a need for coordination between all the agencies because they are all engaged. Right. I, I think that's an, an excellent point because the, uh, you know, our governance has evolved to address issues in, in silos, right? So we have the DEP, which is primarily water-based. We have city planning, which is talking about zoning and density. We have, you know, there, you could go down. There's state issues, state, which is primarily the environmental regulation. So what the challenge is, and this is why um, the Gowanus Canal Conservancy's work is, is, is so important, is that without uh, any kind of coordinating vision or impetus to coordinate, everybody is fulfilling their individual missions within their agencies, but, um, uh, but those uh, agencies are not brought to the, ta to the table together uh, to uh, decide a course of action unless they are forced to by a plan and a section or a, so. So I think the, the reality is, is, is that the no one is individually or no agency is individually responsible. But through this process, I think you are trying to bring people to the table. And those cross sections that I showed, I should, we should put that one up. But we have a drawing of one of those cross sections that indicates the five different agencies that are required to acknowledge and approve that cross section. So do you and want to talk about that? I think that's a really I just want to say the use yeah. of the word responsible is interesting in this context, right? Because there's responsible in the sense of it being their duty. And then there's the Correct. responsible parties the PRPs, found, right, right, right? Of which the city is, is one. And could you talk about that a little bit and who the others might be and, and why the city is held responsible, just to reiterate that? Point. Oh, sure, yeah. Okay, yeah. So, um, so under Superfund law, essentially, um, people that are responsible for the pollution are enter a legal agreement to clean it up, to pay for the cleanup. So the responsible parties in this case are um, National Grid, because they bought the rights to the former manufactured gas plants. And then there's about 15 to 20 other smaller um, companies, many of them 
bot company, bot former industrial companies, like Dun and Bradstreet is one which I just yeah. found out recently. Ooh. Some really weird <laughs> companies that have nothing to do with industrial um, development. Um, and then the city is the other big one because they keep on putting sewage into the canal. Right. This is actually the first Superfund site where sewage was a contaminant of concern, which we're very proud Ooh, of. Um, that's cool. And the city, <laughs> because of that, the city the is the building. The and the, <laughs> totally. and the, the city is building <laughs> two large sewage retention tanks. Yeah. With that, um, right. as a responsible party under that. Right. Yeah. I was. There's a legal definition to responsibility, and then I guess I was kind of taking it more into who's responsible for shepherding this landscape. Um, which is, mm -hmm. it's a different question. And did you want to show that slide? I didn't mean to No, 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 that's fine. Okay. Can, can, I, can I just add that, um, that all those things are, are very true, but ultimately, you know, the city, the state, and the federal government are us, right? Right. We live in America, which is a democracy. So I, I think in, in New York City, and it's understandable the way the city often operates, that we, we sort of, you know, they're doing that, they're doing this, but in fact, it's us doing it, you know? Like, and that's why political participation and, you know, talking, coming to community meetings, et cetera, et cetera, is so critically important. It doesn't work unless we, we are engaged. And um, uh, I'll just plug one little thing that we've, uh, we've done off, off the Manahata Wilikia project. So we created a website called Vision Maker that allows you to pretend you're Kate Orff mm -hmm. and create designs for your own neighborhood. And it then calculates all these environmental parameters and some economic and social ones and allows you to compare <laughs> your vision to that part of the city today to that part of the city as it would have been in a, in a more natural setting 400 years ago. Next question. Um, Obviously, the original uh, industrial development there was because it uh, was adjacent to water transportation. Now, how does that fit into today's plan? Are there still needs for water-based transportation mm -hmm. uh, sites? Uh, do you plan to accommodate them? Or is this something that we can just kick out? And uh, is there going to be commercial shipping in the canal? Yes. So that's, so the industrial, the protected industrial business zone, that southern end of the canal will continue to be manufacturing. There are still water-based industries. There are still concrete plants that bring in raw materials on barges. And that's a really important and sustainable way to do business. Um, the north end of the canal, which is very stagnant and um, more difficult to navigate because there's so much sediment built up, um, is what the city is looking at to rezone. So we see that as not being part of this industrial area. But it is very important to make sure that there's still a place for water-based <coughs> industry in New York City and in this region. I apologize for this question because I'm a really literal person and I'm trying to think about dredging between now and 2025. Does the process of dredging not make the water entirely filthy while that happens? Mm. Is it not, does it not effectively negate the idea of cleanliness or life forms or putting muscles or anything? Uh -huh. And if that's the case, does Kate's really beautiful plan not even begin to happen until 2025? So while they're doing each part of the dredging, they will be, I mean, that, again, they're figuring this out now. They're doing the pilot, so they're seeing how much it impacts the larger water quality. Um, they do have some sort of, like, basically like a screen across the area that they're working in, which will capture large debris. Um, I don't know, I don't know exactly how it will work in terms of what's in the water column. Um, but certainly there is room, even with that contamination, for life to grow. There is our, there's an enormous amount of life in the canal today. We may not want to touch the canal until 2025, but plants and animals certainly do and are touching it right now. Yes. There's a rumor that there were seals in the canal a few years ago. Is it true? <laughs> I think there was a seal. There yeah, was, there was. I think uh, there was a seal that passed yeah. away. Yeah. In the canal. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Story has a bummer of an ending. But, <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, in general, there's a, a remarkable recovery of marine life around New York City. That's a yes. large part because of improvements in water quality mm -hmm. of the kinds that we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. so. 
Yeah, just no. I, where I live in the Bronx, the Bronx River is recovering, and um, that uh, this was several years ago. They spotted a beaver, and so they named the beaver Jose uh, after Congressman Jose Serrano, who like really supported the cleanup of the Bronx River. So, I guess it's lucky that that seal passed away before they named it after a local politician here. Right, right. That <laughs> been, That's right. A bad omen. Uh, Question over but here. But can I, I mean, there's a there's a second part to that Bronx River story, if you don't mind. Yeah, please. But, but there was there was a second beaver that showed up, and so they asked the kids in the neighborhood what to call it. Do you know this? I think I don't know. And uh, and they they decided on Justin. Uh, that's right. Justin Beaver. We're, we're we're very clever up there. Very very clever. Yeah. Yes. This is this is so cool, and thanks for sharing. I'm wondering a little bit more about the actual implementation of the plan and kind of what you need in terms of next steps. It seems like. There's a lot of coordination necessary between the government and communities and other stakeholders. So if you could speak a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, it's... What it's, do you need? <laughs> <laughs> we, need we need engagement. Yes. Um, we need funding. Um, and we need, we need people to help out and work together to do this. So, I mean, we've been working on developing sort of the framework behind this plan for about four years now, really like talking to all the agencies, all the community members, holding charrettes, um, getting people on board with the idea. And right now I feel like we're in a good place in terms of the zoning plan, but getting that natural restoration damages settlement to a place where we need it to be is gonna take a lot more advocacy work, organizing, community engagement, really getting the sorts of um, flood resiliency we need in the industrial business zone, which isn't gonna get the same amount of um, capital that the rezoning area is gonna need, is gonna be a huge endeavor. So engagement is what Great. we need. But it's, yeah, it's a long, complex process. Great. I, I would just add, you know, this, this notion of holding feet to fire, right? I mean, I think what the fear is, and I can kind of hear it from some of the questions in the room, is that these parcels are gonna start flipping and that's just gonna be business as usual. But the Gowanus is so special and it, does, it deserves better and it deserves our participation in, in making sure it is not just another kind of uh, business as usual proposition. And so I think it, it needs that le pressure from people who live <laughs> in Brooklyn and here to, um, uh, to mobilize and to kind of put forward this alternative vision. Um, it also requires, I mean, the other thing I think is interesting about this plan is that, you know, many of you know Frederick Law Olmsted. You know, we're in uh, Brooklyn <laughs> here next to the signature uh, uh, park, parks. This uh, other park. Yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> this is the best part. This is the better one. Um, but that is very different from what we're talking about here. And so the needs are different, yeah. right? So Olmsted was, was designing and, and operating in, you know, when M Manhattan development had not even reached above, what, 15th Street, 30th mm -hmm. Street. And, and so it anticipated growth. What we're talking about here is retroactively developing ecosystems within a very active um, built environment that is changing. So it also requires a different kind of methodology or thinking about stewardship. It requires a different kind of methodology about funding, which is both based on parcelization and, and kind of you know, um, uh, having these developers pay into a kind of a management fund. Um, and it also just requires this incredible coordination of waterfront access, um, which is um, a, a very different process than having a competition called the Greensward and the, this one Greensward plan um, um, being developed out of it, which is more of a singular gesture. This is m a incredibly um, a political process and is a, a process of multiplicity and is a process of coordination. Very different kinds of needs, frankly. Let me ask an idiotic question, because as a journalist, that's what I get to do. But it, just in the way of looking out for unintended consequences. So introducing this kind of urban, marshy place at a time when temperatures are rising, like I'm thinking, Bugs. Are there going to be lots of bugs? And there are, you know, so are we going to like have like cleaner water, but also malaria? Like, how does? <laughs> are we going to introduce bats? Like, what's the? What are yeah, some of the yeah. other? Because it's a natural process you're introducing, right? And so where yeah. there's marshy water, there's there's bugs. You should answer bats, but but yeah. but I think that the, you know, for many many years, um, the lowlands were called just that, right? It's low. It's undesirable. Think about the story of Jamaica Bay in in our history, right? Which was um, uh, an area that was just sort of 
farmed and then it became a waste dump and that became you know, a similar story. And I, I think the key thing is we're trying to think about interconnected systems, right? And that, that these habitats are not just single functional, right? That, that there are birds, um, wading birds, uh, there are bats, there are uh, flycatchers, uh, warblers, and a whole kind of range of, of, of species which are more rich and biodiverse that basically can make this a, a functioning system. Mm -hmm. And I just switched to this slide yeah. because I want to just note that this is what we have now. Yeah. Instead of this like integrated system, we just have large right. amounts of flooding all the time without that sort of yep. ecosystem to help clean it and regulate it. Here's this is Ninth Street. Well, and just remember the invisible, the invisible fish underneath the water too. Mm -hmm. You know, something like 75% of all the commercial fish species that we eat on the East Coast of the United States spend some part of their lifespan in salt marshes. So, you know, if you restore the ecosystems, the species will come, and then they have their interactions with their friends, including mm -hmm. the bugs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a bad way to treat your friends. But. <laughs> um, yeah, hi. So. Um, recognizing that there is a lot of really positive movement toward um, cleaning up much of the New York waterways, from the Bronx out to Jamaica Bay, Floyd Bennett Field with habitats and such. Mm. I'm just wondering how you would actualize in one of your slides the, where it shows the water um, coursing down topographically into the Gowanus from various, like you'll see the arrows, Mm -hmm. And then you'll see green spaces where the arrows were. So how would you actualize that from a built perspective um, without doing outright um, eminent domain and trying to um, have these filtrate the barrel filtrations and such like that without totally um, changing parking and other restrictions? And how does, how does all of that mix of livability come forward into fruition because it is so important for the balancing act that we mm -hmm. all live within. Mm -hmm. so. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I think it's, it's through coming up with smart solutions. I mean, I think that, you know, right now you may be seeing that there's, the city is putting, DEP is putting in curbside rain gardens across the city, mm -hmm. um, which are helping a lot with street drainage are definitely taking parking spaces and aren't necessarily um, being maintained to the level they need to be. I think there are different ways to be building this infrastructure in the street. Um, there's a lot of opportunity and we see Gowanus as really the place to pilot a lot of this stuff because we've got a very engaged population who really cares about the public realm. So this, I mean, yes, there might be trees on top of it, but there could be some sort of suspended pavement system that still allows you to walk on top of this water storage. There's a lot of different ways to sort of move this stuff together in a section that's not just, you know, preservation, mm -hmm. plants, people. Mm -hmm. They can be on top of each other. Can I, um, just to add on that, you know, I think this is a good example of where ecology and city planning come together, right? I mean, so. You know, if you change the streetscape, that means something has to change about transportation too, right? Mm -hmm. Like you can't, you know, as Kate said, you can't like treat these as like separate silos and not have a relationship to each other, right? So as the transportation system of the city changes, that enables you to do other sorts of things, right? It, it really is an ecology of the city that we're, we're talking about here. Um, and in, in that, of course, the very most important factor for human decision making is about money, right? That's what really ultimately drives this. And so there's sort of these kind of, um, I don't know, these efforts we do through city planning and so forth to try and, you know, control and corral that while still having some freedom of, you know, the capitalist spirit. But, you know, the original mistake, if, you know, that the Lenape wouldn't have made, but the Europeans did, was, was that they didn't value the land in the first place, right? And so, you know, when we all pay our property taxes, you get your property tax bill, but it's based entirely on the economic value of your property. If it was also based on the ecological value of your property, what was lost or what its potential could be, then you would actually have economic motivations to actually connect the ecology and the economics together in a way that would actually lead to a better city and not just on a, you know, parcel by parcel or a certain part of the city, but in a holistic kind of way. And until we, until we you know, make that join somehow, and I'm not sure how we get there, unless people like you talk, talk about it and advocate for it, we're never really gonna see the large scale changes that we need. I think we have time for one very quick question. If there's one last hand there. You mentioned earlier about uh, various developers who have their own parcels and almost all of that has been sold. Uh, is there any coordinated effort 
so that all of this development uh, has the, the proper impact on the canal and not, not a negative impact. Mm -hmm. First, because there's going to be an enormous increase in population density, as well as sewage, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera. But if all of these real estate developers have already purchased their land, uh, A, do they have an incentive uh, to do something about it? And B, is there a coordinating effort so that they're all on the same page? Yeah. I mean, so they've own, they own the land, but they haven't gotten their rezoning yet. So that's really a position of power for the community. We can say we do not want to see this development add any new sewage to the canal, and we can come up with the projects that we want either each individual developer or the city to pay for to make that happen. Um, and that's, we, since we don't know yet exactly the type of density that the city's talking about, we don't know exactly what we're asking for yet, but there will be a period of time, um, about a year of negotiation essentially, where the, the community is really going to come forward and say, this is what we need to see in order to actually let this happen. Well, there's a lot more we could say, and uh, I don't know about anybody else, but I'm putting on my mental calendar to go see the waterfront exhibit. Mm -hmm. uh, looks amazing. Um, but I want, I hope we can all uh, thank the Brooklyn Historical Society for hosting us tonight. And thanks to this amazing panel. Have a very good night.